upgrading a mental operating system. Um, I was in graduate school, working on my PhD, walking in towards campus, and I had one of those epiphanous step back moments. I looked at what was going on in this uh, mind space, and it was just a bunch of garbage, just endless nothingness about nothing at all. And I had one of those senses of this is not okay. This is not how we should live our lives. There has to be a better way. Look around, log on. You know what a mess is the world is right now. I think if we can change our basic operating system as fundamentally as we changed from flat earth to round earth, we've got a chance. If not, I think we're SOL. And so what I did was start looking at my current operating system. You know our OS. Very poor signal noise ratio, high bandwidth consumption, high energy consumption, stress generating, nothing much good about it. This is about 76,000 years old. We broke off from chimpanzees six million years ago. This is a very relatively recent innovation, this eye that we have, this egoic operating system. This HS is Homo sapiens, one, first version. ME is Vince's uh, creation. He gave a talk last fall on hacking Microsoft Windows ME. So I borrowed this from him for this uh, first version. I thought, well, how about an HS2? Well, this is HS2 mini-me. <laughs> and the idea here, operating parameters for this design, were, of course, get rid of suffering, good problematic thoughts, but some, maybe some strange things. I wanted it to be completely empirical. I had to be able to validate every step of this operating system myself. I needed a very clean data set. So I said, it has to be something I can personally validate today. Someone who's been alive while well, I've been alive, somebody in contemporary society, someone who hopefully speaks English or spoke English, and nothing from anything in the past. Had to be a contemporary person. I had to have a completely clean, solid data set. <clears throat> I also said it had to be totally open source. There was no strictures on where my search could lead. Oh, no. <laughs> He's done it again. Okay. Also, need to have some kind of a DIY function. I know the, pro the problem with DIY, for me it was, how am I going to check this one? And so I settled on, look, if I can just focus on this self-referential narrative, I've got an automatic meter for DIY. Try something, it's still there. Try something else, it's still there. You can watch and you can see how your brain changes as you go on through your process. This has to be something that was going to be functional in the real world. It couldn't require going off into a cave someplace. This had to be functional real time. It had to improve the functionality, not degrade it. Scientifically verifiable, and it had to be an operating system, not just an experience or a bunch of experiences. I did some very simple thought processes. I looked at thought buckets, my own thought buckets. I had I mean my thoughts and no I mean my thoughts. I watched my brain. Guess what? It's all about me. <laughs> it's never about something else. I looked at things like temporality. Past buckets, present buckets, future buckets. What did I have? All future, all past. Nothing about now. Very simple, almost childlike experiments. I'll just draw my thoughts on a piece of paper. I'll think about A, and then if something changes off of A subject, it goes to B, then I draw, I draw a line. C, D, E, it's just very simple, basic empiricism. It's not up here. Really, it goes like this. I also looked at, I need that slide. Okay, what, is, what was up here is how we form an eye. An eye really, metaphorically, is like a central post framework you have to begin with. 
And on that central framework comes a blizzard of post-it notes through the course of your life, like a snowstorm. Out of those bazillions of snowflakes going past of post-it notes, a very, very few haphazardly stick to this central post. Very few, statistically. You could have formed a thousand other yous out of other haphazardly selected memories that constitute what you are. This, is a, this I is a haphazard collection. I also went looking for a code developer. My code developer was this guy. You may not know him. Armand Maharshi, a big Indian sage. Uh, first part of the 20th century. Henry Cartier Brisson took his last pictures. H.H. Uh, Dalai Lama uh, covered his first book, his, his most recent book. Uh, Carl Jung wrote about him, wrote the foreword to his big thing. Um, very simple, clear, direct, uh, non-religious, uh, not philosophical per se, direct experience, which is what I wanted. Very clean process. Process is self-inquiry. You've all heard of it. Very simple. Where am I? When am I? What is this? Am I this body? Am I these thoughts? Am I these sensations? Nothing fancy here. Can I let go of this? I have an attachment. Can I let go of it or not? And you just keep doing it. The big thing here is persistence. The ego will block you on one front. You've got to find another way around. This is a guerrilla warfare. You just keep coming around other ways to get in. My book, which is downloadable for you, there's so many ways to go into this thing. You can do it with breathing, with asana, with pranayama. You can do it with chanting. There's a lot of ways in, and you'll need them. What happened after 20,000 hours, slow learner, uh, was this. My self-referential blah, blah thoughts just stopped. They just fell away. The big surprise to me was that at the same time that narrative fell away, my self-referential processed desires and fears fell away. And they haven't come back in 15 years, except for these situations here. The big surprise, the really huge surprise to me, was that, and the time this happened, I was doing a yoga posture, the time it happened, I had a thousand people working for me, four research labs, and a quarter billion dollar budget. And I had no narrative. And I thought, how am I going to go into work today? So I went into work, I thought, well, they'll see something. <laughs> nothing. They saw nothing. My big surprise that I was actually better functionally than I had been before. I wasn't losing all this bandwidth. <clears throat> I wasn't having all this narrative going on all the time. And I was present for all the meetings, fully 100% present. I was the only person in the room that was actually there. <laughs> and it's a big advantage to actually be present for the meeting. It's been this way for 15 years. And it really is just this deep quietness inside. And yet you can still, we'll see in a second here, you can still do all your problem-solving planning functions, even better than before. I checked around. Other people, contemporaries who have, who have talked about this same thing, about being free of thoughts. I'm not going to get this bottom, I guess. No, I'm not. This bottom one down here, right-hand corner down there, I gave some talks in Stockholm uh, three years ago in the spring. This guy is an ayahuasquero. <clears throat> He's the founder of the Sante Daime Church. If you know anything about ayahuasca, it's kind of like the church. He gave a plenary lecture. And finished. at the very end of that, he said, it's all about being free of thoughts. This is an ayahuasquero. Free of what? Thoughts. Yeah. Which I wouldn't have guessed in a million years. And I talked about it, too much, about it afterwards. This is also in the, in the history of many disciplines. Dogen Zenji, Zen people, Tao Te Ching, Tanjali Yoga Sutras. What's chopped off down here is the Bhagavad Gita. It's in Dzogchen. Uh, it's all over the place. This is not something I dreamed up or I'm going to dream up. Getting rid of thoughts is a really good thing. We have, tech, we have uh, Cog Neuro now working for us. This is what happens. A one vision of what the eye looks like. And where it manifests. It's all over the place. There is no eye anywhere. It's all over the place. 
ad hoc functionality sweeping across the brain. No, it's no place and every place. Default mode network, Andrews Hanna paper out of Harvard 2010, looked at this, if you aren't doing something, blah, blah kicks in. This blah, blah network that we live with most of the time has two core nodes. You can see them here, and they're deep in the brain. If those two core nodes of this 11-member network are deactivated, the whole network shuts down. These 11 centers are all hooked together, but it depends upon these cores. This one core, subnetwork, gives you self in time. The other one gives you self and other. Self in time, you present, you past. Self and other, which is chopped off here, self and other is you in the chair, you and the person next to you. If those things shut down because you've shut down this core, then you're into the two most common mystical experiences. Now, 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 and everything is one thing, always one. Paper 2007, Farb, out uh, of Toronto, mindfulness meditation, two months, four or five minutes a day. Blah, blah, blah. They meditated for two months. This, this other network generated, came online. This other network is tasking network. Now, 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 task control network, task positive network, great. Oh, bad news, when they stopped meditating, blah, blah, came back. Fast forward 2011, a project at Yale I'm heavily involved in, both as a subject and as a collaborator, Theravadans, 10,000 hours, three common Theravadan meditations, same thing happens, shut down the two core nodes, blah, blah, stops. Big difference, though. This time is in between runs in the fMRI that stayed shut down. But we had persistence, albeit with 10,000 hour terabodens, across time frames when blah blah should have kicked back in again. There's a lot of work going on now in these two networks. We've got a new thing called Granger Statistics, which actually looks at fMRIs in a temporal way and can determine which way the communication is going between those two centers. What this shows, this, is only, this paper is only four months old is that if this default mode network, if blah blah is dominant over now, now, now tasking, you get very poor accuracy and very poor response times and your tasks being performed. Contrary-wise, task positive, it wins out, the opposite happens. Everything gets better, better tasking, better performance. The first mode, default mode network overwhelms task positive network, we believe that's ADHD. We also believe it's autism spectrum disorders. There'll be a lot more work coming out, and this is a really a hot paper right now. We have a very interestingly, uh, adaptively developed, strange arrangement for our capacities. We have a very tiny DRAM sitting on top, which can handle working memory, which is up in here, seven plus or minus two things at a time. Amazingly, across all cultures, across all languages, seven discrete bits of information. If you can solve your problem, seven plus or minus two, you're good to go. You can stay up there. On the other hand, if it gets bigger than that, it goes offline. Your massive parallel processor with huge data storage capacity kicks in and solves the problem. It's like the rider on the elephant, the press secretary on this huge processor underneath it. Very small GUI. It's a, good, it's a reason why we did that evolutionarily, but a very small GUI and a huge processor underneath it. If you have a very complicated problem, like trying to solve 123JKL4N, where you have to have an aha moment, some kind of discontinuity in your solving, <clears throat> you've got to find some other way to do it. You frame the problem up in this GUI, it goes offline, and what happens is back here in this right quadrant, the problem gets worked on. This is the EG. Two good papers, a term called neuroscience, Steth Bhattacharya, 2009-2010. The EG back here, you can see the betas decrease, working on the problem. Problem is getting solved, moves up to the front, gammas kick up over 30, 30 seconds per second. You can see they're active here. And six or seven seconds before you know you've solved the problem, they can tell you the problem's been solved. And then you will jump up on top of the thing and say, I, the writer, have solved this problem. What a fantastic thing I am. <laughs> this this uh, no thought space is not some adult existential uh, emptiness or voice, not shunyata, we used to translate to Heart Sutra. I ask my people I work with in a university town um, who've done a lot of drugs. So <clears throat> let's rank sex, drugs, and persistent 
this type of statement, non-duality, persistent non-duality, and see how those rank out. Well, you find out that, in fact, these people are all, they've done, some of them, everything you can spell uh, in psychedelics. <clears throat> and they rank sex as an eight. It's a typical relative pleasure. And this is 9.7, really, psychedelics. And above that was this persistent non-dual state. They gave it a higher pleasure rating than psychedelics or sex. I know what's going through your heads. Mystic, mystically speaking, there's a scale called Hood Mysticism Scale, which goes from 32 to 160. A doctoral thesis was done on a bunch of us who were persistent in this non-dual state, not having these thoughts. <clears throat> and we ended up with an average score, 36 of us, of 152. Nine of us had a hunt score of 160. Of those, of those nine had 160, five of us had that way 89% of the time or more. So it had become our operating system, this very mystical space. Psychedelics users, contemplatives, and what's chopped off here are psychotics, but they all scored slightly less than the persistent non duals is, and theirs is experiential, and what we do is continuous. The big questions are why aren't more people getting this? Uh, we're working very, I'm working very hard to get, uh, you don't have to do 20,000 hours. We've got to find some way to make this real for people. Fortunately, we found a way, we're finding ways to do that. I was floundering around in the dark. I had two Zen masters, but this was not what they had done. So they could not coach me. They could give me, they could do this, and they did, but they could not coach me along the way. So I flailed around in the darkness for a long, long time. It's much easier now. One guy, it's on my blog, that He's got uh, two years of social meditation. Uh, Worked with me for one year, just emailing back and forth, one phone call. And he's spending days at work, responsible job, wife, kid, no thoughts. Days of work with no thoughts. And loving it. The question will be, though, the first one, do you, want to be, do you really want to be free of your suffering? Because some people do not want to be free of their suffering. <laughs> really? This is the big pushback I get right now. People have told me in conference I just spoke at in, in the Netherlands, uh, you're inhuman. I mean, human people suffer. You're not suffering, you're not human. Which seems strange from a Buddhist perspective. <laughs> Second one, can you let go of your attachments? This is the place where the rubber really hits the road. You can let go of, you know, maybe watermelon in, 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 in Christmas, in December time, but many things you walk down that list of, can I let go of this, can I let go of this, 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 and this. And it needs to be, in my experience, a conscious pursuit of what the attachments are that are left and getting rid of them. There are devices to do that, there are protocols to do that, but this is really where it gets tough. Something else that really scares folks, what has scared me too, is this last one. Can you live without illusion of free will? Most cognitive neuroscientists now would say there is no free will. We've pretty well demonstrated that. The problem is, how do we tell people? <laughs> <laughs> and what this was for me was I absolutely was certain that I had determined my situation. I had, through my, my cleverness and hard work and, and brilliance and everything else, I had made all the successes that take place until the, the eye fell away and I was standing there with no eye. And the only, you just face with no, no what happens. What am I going to do? I obviously wasn't in control then because there was no I here now. I had no sense it really was an I before. I just didn't know it. And so you're sitting there. If there's no I, there can't be anybody in control. There can't be anybody having a free will. I thought this would be a terrifying place. Uh, as I work with people, it is the sweetest place you can imagine. You wouldn't believe that, but it is because what you say is you can say, well, I can let go of all the responsibility for all the past things, the bad things I think I did, all my sin and karma. And surprisingly, it doesn't throw you into Bacchanalian revelry. It just doesn't work that way. So these are the three main barriers. If you can get past those, you can go a long ways down this path. However far you can go, you can begin seeing your thoughts deconstruct, the kind of thoughts you have deconstruct, the intensity of the thoughts, how closely they are wired together, what they're about. You can see all that change, you begin to work your way down this path. It's not, nothing happens until 10 or 20,000 hours, and then something happens. Stuff happens almost immediately. One thing people say, well, aren't you worried about being non-compassionate? 
Well, my experience with this too is we are coded into getting dopamine for being compassionate. The earlier talk was about getting tweets. Okay, I have to quit. Anyway, compassion, if you come to compassion with complete emptiness and presence, you don't bring an agenda with you to that compassionate moment. You really are there, fully present, second to second, with whatever needs to be done. And in my experience, a much higher quality of compassion emerges without an agenda. Thank you.